Hi everyone, welcome back to the part two series of flight testing your amateur built aircraft. I told you we were going to break it up into three parts. So today we're going to do part two. That has to do with the aircraft. Next week we'll talk about the pilot. So when we talk about the aircraft, hopefully those of you who have just finished your amateur built aircraft got a really thorough inspection by either a DAR or a FISDO inspector, sometimes a MITO inspector, uh, that is really familiar with your aircraft. Okay? I know I, when I do them, I try and make it the most thorough pre-flight anybody's going to have on their aircraft. Uh, I picture myself being in that aircraft. As a matter of fact, I've done a lot of first flights, so there's a selfish reason for doing that as well. But again, at the end of the day, I have to put my head on the pillow, and I want to make sure it's right for all of you. For, for those of you who maybe just uh, don't have the opportunity to find somebody that's really experienced in your aircraft, one of the things I'd recommend you do after the DAR leaves is not be so quick to want, just want to put it together and go fly. I've seen that happen so many times. People are standing by with all their buddies, and as soon as the DAR leaves, how pow, everything goes back together. I got to tell you, there's things that can get missed even by the most thorough set of eyes. So take the time, leave all the inspection panels off, and give it a very, very thorough pre-flight by yourself, some of your best friends. Carol even manages to find things that I've missed. It's amazing. I'm happy that she does that. It's embarrassing at times, but it, it tells you how frail human nature is when you're looking at something that uh, you've probably looked at a hundred times before and you just don't even notice it. I know many of you have heard me talk about jam nuts. I can't tell you how many airplanes I've found loose jam nuts. The worst one being an RV-10. I did a DAR on 14 loose jam nuts. And it just, you know, it happens. You're busy doing the adjustment of the flight controls and you put all the bolts back in and you kind of forget to go back and tighten up the jam nuts to lock everything in place. The worst one I've ever seen was the whole pitch control rod in an RV that had been flying for a number of years. The jam nuts were loose at both ends. You could reach in and actually twist that pitch control rod. So, you know, jam nuts don't typically come loose if they're properly tightened. And put some cross check on them so you can uh, check them on, you know, subsequent uh, pre-flights. But I can't emphasize enough, do a very thorough pre-flight. Okay, that airplane is going to be really important that everything's working properly on that first flight for you. Now, most accidents happen during the first eight hours of flight testing amateur built aircraft. And the central reason for the majority of those are fuel problems. One of the things I always ask when I'm DARing an airplane is, have you modified the fuel system? Because if you have, we're going to look at it really, really, really closely. Okay, and I'm going to want to see some tests done. Matter of fact, because of that statistic, if uh, you have operating limitations today tell you that you can use a task-based program, you can use one like the EAA has created in the flight test book, and we're going to talk about that next week when we talk about the pilot. But there's also an advisory circular 90-89C that will help you actually do your own flight test program. But one of the things in that flight test program that's required, especially if you're going to use the additional pilot program, so I think it's really a good practice to do all the time, is to do a fuel flow test in a climb attitude. Now, for a tail dragger airplane, that's pretty easy to do. You don't have to do anything. For something like the RV-10 or some of the other nose gear aircraft, basically you're going to have to figure out a way to pull that tail down. Okay? Sometimes you can just have a bunch of people hold it down, etc. But basically what we're going to want to do is disconnect the fuel where it goes right to the either the fuel servo or the carburetor. Now right down here, so you can see this one, I put a piece of blue tape. We're going to talk about that blue tape. But I put a piece of blue tape on that hose there so you can see the inlet to the fuel servo. In this case, it's an airflow performance fuel servo. You want to disconnect that when you've got it in the climb attitude. And then you, what you want to do is turn on your fuel selector. And in the case of a low wing airplane like we have here, you're going to have to use your boost pump. For a high wing airplane, airframe, the gravity flow is what you want to check. But basically you want 150% of maximum power fuel flow. So an IO540 as an example is usually 25 to 30 gallons. So we're going to want about 45 gallons measured fuel flow when we disconnect it there and turn on the fuel pump. Now you want to be careful and take some safety precautions. Make certain the aircraft is grounded properly 
and make sure whatever container that you're draining the fuel into is also grounded to the airframe. We don't want any sparks to occur between those two things. So you can either do it by timing, by measuring a couple of gallons coming out of there, use a stopwatch. If you've calibrated your fuel flow sensor, sometimes you can just use that, but there's a good chance the fuel flow hasn't been calibrated yet. So you're just gonna have to use a stopwatch and measure it. Again, be careful, but that's a really, really important test. Do it if you have multiple tanks on both tank selector positions. Now you wanna make certain you have no obstruction. I also think it's a good idea to do this because during the normal course of construction, be it a fiberglass airplane or a metal airplane, sometimes there's a lot of junk inside those tanks. So flushing those tanks uh, is really a good idea. Matter of fact, I may have forgot to mention this, but you might consider doing this fuel flow test prior to running the engine the first time. That way we don't get any of that junk in the, system, in the tanks or the fuel system into the engine or the fuel servo. Okay, so very, very important fuel flow test. After that, basically, it's a very, very thorough pre-flight. Okay, we've already run the engine, so we wanna put all the cowlings and everything back on. One of the things that hasn't been done yet are the brakes. So brakes on aircraft, unlike your car, they kinda of need to be worked in, they need to be set. Now, for those of you who are experienced or you're taking an experienced pilot with you in the additional pilot program, I usually set those brakes on the way out. Okay, what we want to do is get everything just ready to go and check the brakes and try and get them on the taxi out. That way uh, we're not doing any long ground runs. Uh, I would also recommend that for first flights, if you have wheel pants, leave them off, especially if you have a new engine. That extra drag will cause you to require more power, which is what you want for a new engine. You want to break it in with some higher power settings. So leave all the wheel pants off. And uh, plus, that'll help the brakes cool better while you're taxiing out there because you're going to the brakes are going to get hot while you're seating in those brake pads. And you really don't want to stop and do it a couple of times. You just want to do it on the way out to the runway if you can. After that, it's a very thorough walk around pre-flight. You want to make certain that after you put everything back together, all the controls work from stop to stop, which means you should hear a very definite stop to stop. OK, I'm going to grab the RB10 stick here. And if you listen, you'll hear it hit a stop. Hear that? It hits it on the other side. Stops are on opposite sides of the ailerons on the RV-10. You want to make certain your flaps go up and down. And one of the things I would simulate with all flight controls is a little bit of load on them. Remember, we're going to be in flight now for the first time. So have somebody grab one of the flight controls, your ailerons. You're not going to do this real hard, but hold it somewhat and then move your stick back and forth. <clears throat> Make certain there's no slop and it doesn't bind anywhere. Same thing with the flaps. As you're deploying the flaps, put some pressure on them, just like you would have an aerodynamic load. Make certain they're working okay. There's no grinding noises. They don't get stuck. And in fact, they do come up again when you retract them. One of the things I'd recommend on first flight, unless you're really, really experienced or you have an additional pilot with you, regardless of the transition training you've had, make your first landing with half flaps, just in case you have to go around, the flaps don't come back up, et cetera. You're not in a full flap position. So give that some thought while you're doing that, okay? Uh, with the regards to the rest of the airframe, again, it's a thorough pre-flight, just like you would pre-flight any other aircraft. Make certain there's no loose objects inside the cabin. Make sure unoccupied seat belts are attached. Make certain as you deflect those controls from stop to stop, both fore and aft, they're not going to catch on anything in the cockpit. Nothing's going to come loose. You haven't set anything over there, including clipboards, things you might be using to take notes. Those can slide forward sometimes, get jammed between seats, jam up on sticks, fall, get jammed up on rudder pedals, etc. Make certain your rudder pedals go full deflection, and at full deflection, you have braking as well. Sometimes what will happen if you're not paying attention when you set the rudder pedals, especially for those of you who are taller, when you go ahead and move a rudder pedal to full deflection, you may find you don't have brake pedal because it's now hitting the firewall. Or maybe it worked on the bench when you put it together, but now you've added some firewall insulation. Maybe you've added some hoses, some wiring, etc. All of a sudden that stuff can get in the way. It could catch and snag. So again, very, very thorough pre-flight. Picture yourself in flight and needing to use full controls for whatever the reason might be. Make sure there's no obstructions and nothing binds in any way. 
Do it in a quiet environment when you're doing the rudder cables especially. Make certain you can hear that cable going. It's not rubbing. For those of you who might have pulleys in your control system, you want to make certain those cables are in fact on the pulleys. Stay on the pulleys. Don't bind anywhere. Hopefully you paid attention when you were building the aircraft and you put keepers on those pulleys where the cable went across so the cable can't come off. Remember, once we get up in flight, things are going to start bouncing around. It's going to be a lot of noise. We're not going to hear those things. So uh, that's about it, I think, for first flight around the aircraft. Uh, one other thing I'd make certain that I've seen some accidents now that I think about it. Please make certain the doors are closed before you even taxi out to the runway. I know it can be hot sometimes when you're going out there for first flights and it's, you know, you want to leave a door cracked or whatever. I would encourage you, there's a lot of things going on during the first flight. It can be very much sensory overload. It's very easy to forget a door. I actually lost a friend already to a door that popped open on takeoff. It was the opposite door. Trying to reach and close that door uh, can just cause a problem. We're going to talk about distractions when we talk about the pilot next week. But again, when you leave your hangar with that engine running to go out to the runway, you should be ready to take off. Make certain you've got a checklist. You've gone through it. Make sure that checklist works for your aircraft. And again, we'll talk about uh, pilot mental things next week. Right. Thanks for listening. Hope everybody has fun watching the Super Bowl if you're going to do that. And for those of you that aren't, hopefully you got a little halftime uh, entertainment here. Thanks for watching. So I mentioned I was going to talk about the blue tape, and I forgot. So I want to come back to the blue tape. So one of the last things I tell everybody when I license their airplane is that it's no longer a project. It's a certified flying machine. What that means is you really want to pay attention to anything that you leave kind of somewhat undone. You disconnect something, just like the fuel line we mentioned a little bit ago. Uh, we get interrupted. We're in an interrupt-driven society, right? So one of the things I do is I keep in the hangar roll blue tape. I go through these things quite a bit. If you're doing something, you've got disconnected, just like you saw I had blue tape on that fuel line. Take the time to put some blue tape on it. One of the things I'll do when I'm working on my aircraft that are already flying in the hangar, if I've got something off that's a flight safety item, I'll take a piece of blue tape and I'll put it over top of the ignition switch. And I'll write on there the reason why. What happens? The phone rings, you get called away for lunch, somebody comes in to visit you, etc. It's very, very easy to forget. And that goes with this new aircraft that you just got licensed. There's a lot of things on there that are really quite critical as you're putting this thing back together. So you want to pay attention. If you're halfway through something, get interrupted, put a piece of blue tape on it.